In the book of Colossians, one of Paul's prison epistles, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 12 and going through verse 14, we find the following words. Put on, therefore, as God's elect, holy and beloved, a heart of compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving each other. If any man have a complaint against any, as the Lord forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. The Koine Greek word for perfect, perfectness in this passage is a term teleos. And it means symmetrical beauty, rotundity, that which is excellent. And so above everything else, the child of God from a man in prison is admonished, put on love, which is a bond, belt, or gird of perfectness. We live today in a world in which love is sadly lacking. But could you visualize a world without any love? Can you feature what it might be like to be thrown in the midst of a people completely devoid of mercy, kindness, concern, feeling, sympathy, and understanding one for another? Or could you even visualize what it might be like to live in a world where everyone is hateful and hating to one another? If there were no love, life would not be worth living. Man would be reduced to nothing more than a mere brute. The whole of humanity would freeze and starve, and there would be no unity. From two modern translations, found in Colossians 2 and verse 2, the Bible says, It is by love that we are knit together. And again, love binds everything together in perfect harmony. I am discussing with you the world's number one asset. I believe you can name as many qualities as you would desire to name. And it will still be said, the greatest of these is love. Let us see today if we can give some reasons why that biblical love is the world's number one asset. First of all, may I suggest that biblical love is the world's number one asset because it is so godlike. In the book of 1 John in chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 through 8 and maybe following, the Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is begotten of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Herein was the love of God manifested in us. That God has sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now going back to verse 7 and verse 8. There are two very fine, brief, concise statements that illustrate the fact that love is godlike. In 1 John 4 and verse 7, love is of God. In 1 John 4 and verse 8, God is love. All of God's attributes are revealed to us in one word, and that's love. Do you recall how great the Bible says faith is? In the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing unto God. For he that cometh to God must believe that God is, and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. King James translation. But the Bible never does say God is faith. And do you recall how great hope is? In the 8th division, the 24th section of the book of Romans, 
Paul said, for by hope are we saved. But again, the Bible never does say that God is hope. It does not say God is faith, nor God is hope, regardless of how great they are. But it does say that God is love. God has in no word uttered himself and all that is in his heart more clearly or more distinctly than he has in one word, God is love. In fact, the Bible says that love and God can never be separated. In the book of Romans, for an example, in chapter 8, beginning in verse 35, who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or anguish, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And then the writer says, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We are killed all the day long. But he says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that takes us through the end of the chapter in verse 39. Love is the world's number one asset then, because it is so godlike. But I believe there's a second reason why we can label love the world's number one asset. That you can name as many qualities as you want, and that we will still be discussing the greatest quality known to mankind, and that will be love. Love is the basis of the great commandment. There is in the Old Testament in the book of Second Law, Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, a statement that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind with all thy strength. Jesus in Matthew 22, in Luke chapter 10, in Mark chapter 12, when confronted by a group of people and a lawyer said, Teacher, which is the first and great commandment of the law? And Christ gave the great Shema passage of the Israelites when he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And love is our greatest asset because it is a basis in God's view of the great commandment. But I believe there's a third reason why biblical love is a basis of a statement that it belonged to the world in the very first category. Our number one priority and that is because it is the mainspring of a Christian's activities. Faith is great. Hope is great. Being able to speak with the tongues of men of angels is great. But in the face of love, they fade away. Paul said, now about his faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the mainspring of all of our activities. And no matter to what degree or to what element in life a person is motivated for, whatever good he might accomplish, unless he is motivated and moved by this biblical principle, he is nothing. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy, and have all knowledge, know all mysteries, and have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And if I give my body to be burned, all my goods to feed the poor, but have not love, I am nothing. So stated Paul by the pen of inspiration to the church of God in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. In the fourth place, love is great because it is a royal law. It is a kingly law. It's a law much higher, highly elevated 
than anything that man can think of or do. So much higher is God's thought than our thought and His ways and our ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are His thoughts and our thoughts. And the Bible says in James 2 and verse 8, How be it, if you fulfill the royal law, thou shalt love thy neighbors as self, you do well. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 13 through 16, If you bite and devour one another, he says you'll be consumed of one another. But the whole law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And of course, that is the second commandment. But again, let me hasten to say that love is our greatest asset because of its very inherent qualities. In 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4, and going through verse 8, the first part, 8a, Love suffereth long, and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself up, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not its own, is not provoked, rejoiceth not in unrighteousness, but rejoiceth with the truth. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Love never faileth. Love is great because Paul, just prior to this chapter in chapter 12, 31, as he closed chapter 12, said, Desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but here, moreover, I show unto you a more excellent way. Some translations say a most excellent way. Love is great because it is a most excellent way. And then let me say that love is great. Our number one asset because it is a badge, the token, the label of discipleship. I don't believe there's another verse in all 27 books of God's New Testament like unto John 13, 35. When Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one toward another. He did not say so many things, and yet he said this. Taking a passage out of Leviticus, employing it beginning in verse 34 and 35, Christ said, We are to love one another, even as I have loved you. And it is by this that the world shall know that you belong to me. Somewhere then, between six and seven reasons, I list for your thinking today, love is the world's number one asset. It is so godlike. The basis of the great commandment, the mainspring of a Christian's activities, the royal law, the badge of discipleship, because of its inherent qualities, and because, in the words of Paul, it is the most excellent way. But what is this thing called love? In our English language, and I sometimes say, bless its heart, and even though there are about 800,000 words, we only have one word for love. Never has a word been so abused and misused and misconstrued as has this biblical word love. In fact, some people even confuse lust with love. How long has it been since you have taken the Word of God and made a fresh insight into the study of the root meaning of the word love? I want you to see that love must not only have an object, it must have an objective as well. Love must not only have degree, it must have directions as well. Originally, there were various words for love. There are in the Hebrew, and there are in the Greek. Four Greek words stand out. One is never employed in the New Testament. One only in the negative. But two are used to the Greek term phileo, or philos, and the word agape. One meant friendship type of love. 
Another meant the type of love that expected something in return. But the love that we're discussing today is the word that describes God. It ought to refresh our hearts. It's the Greek word agapao, A-G-A-P-A-O. Normally we hear the term agape, one verb, one a noun. I believe it takes five words to adequately describe the biblical term agapao. It is the will to do good. In the book of Romans in chapter 13 and verse 10, Paul says, Love worketh no ill toward his neighbor, for love is a fulfillment of the law. Now why, Paul, doesn't love work some ill toward his neighbor? Simply this. Love is the will to do good. There is only in love a fixed, definite, determined resolution for that which is good on behalf of another. Everything about God is good. James 1, 17. And even when God chastens us, the Bible in Hebrews 12, verse 6 says, My son, regard not lightly the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art reproved of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son that he receiveth. Even the chastening from God is for our good. And if I intend to be God-like, I must have this same attribute in my heart. For an example, in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Paul said, Let all that you do be done in love. And in Colossians 3 and verse 14, the text for this hour, Paul said, And above all of these things, like kindness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, forgiveness, put on love, because that's the bond of perfectness. Love is the will to do good. A person cannot say that he loves God unless he works for the good of the Lord, the good of an individual, or the good of the church. You see, you cannot hurt and cripple and destroy and say that you love. But love must not only have that object and objective. Love must have degree and direction. The greatest measure of the heart is love without measure. Or the greatest measure of love is love without measure. We're talking just now about an attitude of the heart. We're talking about a disposition of the soul. Paul to Timothy said, But the end of the charge is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned. To the church of God in Rome, Paul said in chapter 12 and verse 9 of the Roman letter, Let love be without hypocrisy. John penned 1 John in chapter 3, 18. John said, My little children, let us not love in word or with the tongue, but in deed and truth. We are to grow in love one toward another. Unfeigned love, 1 Peter 1, 22. We are to abound in love one toward another and toward all men. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12. No wonder then by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. I cannot love money, 1 Timothy 6, 10, because that might rob me of my love for God, Matthew 6, 24. God deserves all of man. Matthew 10, 37, Matthew 22, 36 through 38. I cannot love the glory of men more than the glory of God, John 12, 42. I cannot love self more than I love my Lord, 2 Timothy 3, 2 and 4. I can't love to have the preeminence like Diotrephes in 3 John 9. The Bible says that if I don't love my brother, I cannot love God, 1 John 4, 20. And yet I'm to love no one more than I love God. Matthew 22, 36 or 38. For God deserves the whole of my heart, my mind, my soul, my body, and my strength. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, 
The Bible says this people with their lips show much love, but their heart goeth after their gain. And Christ in Matthew 15 and verse 8 said, They honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Paul prayed for the Philippians in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, that their love might grow and develop in knowledge and all discernment, that they might approve the things that are excellent. No wonder then, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said, Love beareth, believeth, hopeth, endureth all things. J.B. Phillips, in his modern version of the Word of God, said of that passage in 1 Corinthians 13, Love knows no limit to its endurance, no fading of its trust, no end of its hope. It can outlast everything. It is, in fact, the one thing that shall stand when everything else has fallen. Love believeth all things. It beareth all things, hopeth, endureth. What does it mean that love endureth all things. It conceals or covers all things. It has learned the art of silence as to the faults of others that annoy and vex me. It believeth all things. That doesn't believe, mean that I believe white is black. But in generous or doubtful cases, I am too full of compassion to suspect someone unjustly. It hopeth all things. Have you ever tried to inform a mother of the faults of an absent son? She wants to know all about her informant. Why? Because love suspects no evil. It beareth, believeth, hopeth, endureth all things. A world without love is a very chaotic world. A world void of trust is where you have your sympathy and your understanding blocked. Brotherly love turns brown with the frost of suspicion. I like the statement by Henry Foster when he said, When love is a judge... It'll be on the side of a prisoner. I like what Luther Burbank said when he said, Every weed is a possible flower. In love there's vision. For you see, lovelessness is a robber, but love is a rewarder. There is victory in love, and there's vanity without love. Love is the highest relation that I can sustain to God and the closest that I can assume to a brother. Therefore, the Bible says, Let love. Other brethren continue, Hebrews 13, verse 1. Love sees what no eye sees, what no ear hears. We beseech you at the urgent behest of Christ to possess the world's number one asset. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere He leads me in this world below. Anywhere without Him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot go. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, He is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over drearest ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Summons me to go or stay Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep When the darkening shadows round about me creep Knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go.
This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.